Oh, should we stay on? I don't know if she said to leave the video on. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. Hopefully you can't hear that somebody's playing music above me. I, I heard oh, really? it too. I was. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually thought and that there was part nothing of the I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just above you. <laughs> yeah, nothing I can do. Welcome to those of you who have joined. We're going to wait just another minute or two as more folks are joining, and we'll get started momentarily. Okay, I think I'll get started. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight for the 2021 Charles Gordon Lecture given by Mabel O. Wilson. On behalf of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism at Carleton University, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. My name is Zach Colbert, and I'm a member of the school's faculty and associate director of graduate programs and I'm very pleased to serve as the faculty host for this evening's program. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you all to Charles Gordon, the namesake of tonight's lecture. He was the chair of sociology and anthropology, professor of architecture, coordinator of the directed interdisciplinary study program here at Carleton. He was a beloved administrator and a distinguished educator at Carleton over his 37 year career. This lecture series was created in his honor to recognize the countless contributions he has made to both Carleton in mind and in spirit. This lecture series exists in perpetuity to bring together Charles Gordon's two deepest interests, design and the social sciences. And it is organized collaboratively among the schools of architecture, industrial design and the department of anthropology. This evening marks the final lecture in our forum lecture series for this academic year. This year, our series focused attention on equity, justice, and projects and ideas that challenge and inspire us to re-envision our future and to look beyond the Eurocentric canon. We are immensely grateful for the generosity of our forum lecture series sponsors, whose gifts extend vital support to the academic life of our school, enabling lectures that welcome world-renowned architects and scholars into our school's community, just as we are tonight. Thank you as well to Director Jill Stoner, to John Cook, Gabrielle Argent, Ellen Parasud, and Mike Getz, whose efforts have organized and enabled tonight's virtual gathering. We are a substantial audience this evening, nearly 200 strong, tuning in from across North America. I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation, whose traditional and unceded territory is where Carleton University's campus is located. Carleton University acknowledges that it has a responsibility to the Algonquin people and a responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocols. And as we gather virtually tonight, let us all acknowledge that wherever we may be presently located on Turtle Island, we are guests on the unceded lands of First Peoples. Mabel's lecture tonight is entitled Studio and a Black Study. Following Mabel's lecture, professors Mokena Makeka and Mario Gooden will serve as respondents and initiate a broader conversation in response to Mabel's work. I'd like to make a quick technical note for everyone. Following the presentation, we will utilize the Q&A function and not the chat. So please feel welcome to place your questions into the Q&A. We're all familiar with Zoom in our, our current virtual reality. 
Um, but the webinar format is just a little bit different from meetings. So I'm making that note. Professor Mokena Makeka is joining us from Cape Town, South Africa this evening, where he is an accomplished architect, artist, curator, scholar, urbanist, and global leader among many other things. Mokena joined our faculty this year as an Israeli visiting critic, and he is also an adjunct professor at the Cooper Union's Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture in New York City. Thank you, Mokena, for being with us across an ocean, a hemisphere, and many time zones tonight. Professor Mario Gooden is joining us from New York City tonight, where he is partner in the office Huff Gooden Architects. His cultural practice of architecture engages the intersectionality of architecture, race, gender, sexuality, and technology. Mario also joined our faculty this year as a visiting critic in practice, and he is a professor of practice at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. Thank you, Mario, for joining us tonight from New York. Dr. Mabel O. Wilson is the Nancy and George Rupp Professor of Architecture, a professor of African-American and African diasporic studies, and the director of the Institute for Research in African-American Studies at Columbia University in New York City. Beyond Columbia, Mabel has held academic appointments at Princeton University, the University of California at Berkeley, the California College of the Arts, Ohio State University, and the University of Kentucky. Her background bridges design and the social sciences. She holds two degrees in architecture and one PhD in American studies. Two fields that inform her scholarship, her curatorial projects, artworks, and her design work. She is a sought after public intellectual with a unique expertise in weaving together culture, history, place, design, art, architecture, and scholarship. And we are very lucky to have her with us tonight. In her work, she explores the complex and often hidden connections between race and the built environment and opens up new intersections between disciplines and new possibilities across methods, all while writing previously on written histories. This work is including Black contributions to the American narratives of architecture and culture. It is the changing the way architecture is taught worldwide and is expanding public discourse around social justice. Mabel is a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, an advocacy project that seeks to educate the architecture profession about the myriad issues of globalization and labor practices in the built environment. Mabel has published two books, Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and Negro Building, Black Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums. Mabel is also co-editor of the recently published volume race and modern architecture. Through her transdisciplinary practice, Studio End, she makes visible and legible the ways that anti-Black racism shapes the built environment, along with the ways that Blackness creates spaces of imagination, refusal, and desire. Her research investigates space, politics, and cultural memory in Black America, race and modern architecture, new technologies, the social production of space, and visual culture in contemporary art, media, and film. Mabel is co-curator of Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, currently on view at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Incidentally, this show was featured in The Guardian just today. The show asks, how can architecture address a user that has never accurately been defined? And further, how can we construct Blackness? The show also asks MoMA to come to terms with gaps in its own collection and past exclusionary curatorial practices. Studio And has been a competition finalist for several important cultural institutions, including Lower Manhattan's African Burial Ground Memorial and the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture in collaboration with Diller Scofidio and Renfro. For her most recent design collaboration, she was a member of the architectural team that created the highly publicized memorial to enslaved African-American laborers at the University of Virginia. Her work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale, the Istanbul Design Biennial, the Cooper Hewitt National D Design Museum's Triennial, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, among many other respected venues. Beyond this extraordinary list of accomplishments and accolades, I'd like to suggest that there is perhaps one more. 
Mabel Wilson taught me how to teach. And it, is my great, it was my great privilege to learn from Mabel at Columbia University for seven years, where we together taught design studios investigating sites in New York City, Detroit, Johannesburg, Lagos, and Accra. And it was through these experiences that my own desire for an academic career was born and by virtue of Mabel's mentorship that I came to join the faculty here at Carleton. It is truly a personal, great personal joy to welcome one of my most significant professional mentors into our school's community this evening. Mabel, thank you very much for joining us tonight and welcome. Thank you, Zach, um, for that. And I'm gonna tear up <laughs> <laughs> um, for that wonderful introduction. And, and I do wanna say that I speak to you from the unceded land of the Munsi Lenape um, uh, here. Um, that is now New York City. Um, I also wanna say that it's an honor to be giving the Charles Gordon lecture. And I wanna thank both Zach and also um, Jill Stoner for the generous invitation uh, to to share my work with you all this evening. Um, I also want to thank John Cook and all those behind the scenes who have made today's talk possible, including the amazing graphics uh, that you see announcing the, the lectures um, this semester. And also a special thanks uh, to a couple of my partners in crime, Mokena Makeka, um, coming from uh, Cape Town and also Mario Gooden, um, my colleague here in New York City, and also um, uh, uh, showing in uh, reconstructions, so which I'll talk about uh, in that. Okay, I am going to get started and hopefully I can get this right. Okay, so hopefully you see what I see. <laughs> okay. Right. So I began Studio And um, in 2007, uh, and I chose the ampersand as a sign that my practice was both collaborative, as in, and other people, as well as transdisciplinary, as in, and other disciplines. I think as this diagram indicates, my body of work has navigated, you know, as, um, as Zach indicated, between written and scholarly works, architectural and design projects, installations, artworks, videos, performances, and curatorial projects. In many ways, I am undisciplined. Um, but the critical research of Studio N finds an expression in one mode, which is what this early diagram showed, and then which often leads to a parallel project in another creative modality. Now, I recognize during my uh, Masters of Architecture study that in order to draw blackness into architectural discourse and to make visible anti-black racism, that I needed to transgress the boundaries of architecture. And I needed to turn elsewhere to art, to critical race theory, to literature. And like the work of Toni Morrison, um, find ways of sort of working critically. Uh, and she's been a, an important model for my critical practice. And here she says that my effort to manipulate, and she uses the word English language, but I use architecture. So my effort to manipulate architecture was not to take standard architecture and use vernacular to decorate or paint it, but to carve away its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence, so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but were inevitable. And this is a paraphrasing from 
a rephrasing from her essay, Black Matters. It was important to reckon with in this work, you know, the body of work of, of Studio N and that I really worked on, I would say, for the last 30 years, it was important to reckon with the way that the Western episteme, bodies of knowledge, and our ontological framework, ways of being, and typically this is of whiteness, made it provisional, if not impossible, for the African, along with the African blackened in the hold of the slave ship, to become Negro, to attain historical consciousness, what the West imagines as being modern. That reg uh, relegation to the category of the primitive, just at the threshold of modernity, is a misreading, I think, on what it means to be modern. Poet Nurbesi Phillips, like Morrison, recognizes the trap of languages of the West, and she distrusts the language of letters, documents, policies, of being, and history. Philip writes in, in her uh, book, Zong, that, quote, the language in which those events took place promulgated the non-being of African peoples. And I distrust this disorder, this order which hides disorder, its logic hiding the illogic, and its rationality, which is simultaneously irrational, end quote. What is modern architecture but not dedicated to order, logic, and rationality? Can it be also hiding disorder, illogic, and irrationality, which is the double bind of modernity, as we see in this pairing in the painting of both liberty and slavery? The discourse of architecture, its representational tools, its historiography, its dependency on state power and racial capitalism, it's, and its aesthetic and technologies are not it with this double bind of racialized thinking, representation, and practices. So in response, over the past 30 years, I've engaged in a Black study, one that allows me to see my own history and bring Black cultural practices into the making of the built world. In a sense, my practice has been what Fred Moten and, Moten and Stefano Harney have called, quote, fugitive planning and black study, unquote. My practice has been dedicated to forging connections, making spaces of collaboration, kinship and exchange, spaces of love and mutual support. Study doesn't engage what is known, but rather it is a speculative practice and one that allies with liberation as a spatial practice, a belief that my collaborator Mario Gooden forges in his work. This ethos underwrites Studio and as I've explored themes of home place, remembery, and mobility. Home places. In Studio 6, taught at GSAP by Stan Allen, and this is my last semester in architecture, Stan asked us to unpack the single family American suburban house through techniques of collage. I chose to discover blackness, anti-blackness. Growing up in, as Diane Harris would write, a little white house in coastal New Jersey in 1960, seen here, uh, it was actually designed by my father. My entree into the world of language and ideas was through this book, Before We Read, whose pictures, as you can see, reinforce gender roles and whose whiteness is normalized not by words, but by images. For the studio project, I turned to Toni Morrison's epigraph in The Bluest Eye where she carves away at the iconic Dick and Jane primer, like before we read. So in the first paragraph, we know, notice it's grammatically correct. It teaches us to read and write. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door and so forth. And we learn this within the rules of grammar. But what else does it teach us? Note the second paragraph. The rules of grammar have been removed. No capitalization, just in the first word and no sentences. Words without pause, meaning becomes tenuous. 
here is the house that is green and white with a red door. And so it's a very difficult sensibility, you could say, about temporality. Third paragraph, Morrison squeezes out the space between the words, making reading and hence making reading impossible, but also making enunciation, that is speech, that is the physical occupation of the word, also impossible. It is both silence and madness. And The Bluest Eye, if you've not read it, it's a really remarkable book, it's early, Morrison. She tells us the story of a black girl who lives amidst untold violence and suffering. Pecola Breed Love, the protagonist, believes if she had blue eyes, she would be beautiful, hence happy and safe. But instead, insanity becomes her refuge. For me, this epigraph to the bluest eye became a methodological exercise in the power of representation and meaning, or how whiteness orders meaning. So can the same misreading, rewriting or redrawing be done with the rational methods of architectural representation? A long history of white settler colonialism in the United States, which forged whiteness as property, as scholar Shaw Harris writes, has allowed restrictive covenants and bank lending practices to ensure that America's post-war federally financed suburbs stayed white and heteronormative. So you hear, she says, we were happy Levittown was going to be all white, which is essentially why she moved here. Sorry about the sound. I had to adjust the sound in the Zoom. And so I have one large, loud file. So hopefully it doesn't disrupt the other ones too much. So I adapted Morris's carving of, strat of, car of strategy of carving away, working into the, 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 the plan and the section signifiers and representations of blackness. I looked for these um, representations, the mask, Aunt Jemima, the charm, between, behind, below, within the walls, the cabinets, the floors, the basement, the attic of the iconic Levittown house. In the end, I discovered the house for Grigri, a talisman and container for the rituals of everyday life. Black artists have had a long history working with found objects, Romer Bearden's collages, for instance. And I turned toward the assemblage art of Betty Saar, whose liberation of Aunt Jemima became a key figure in making the house for Grigri. But I also drew on the familiar work of LA-based artist John Outerbridge, who recently passed away in November. John Outerbridge, who is my mother's brother, grew up in the Jim Crow South. So, I show here the house of my grandparents in Greenville, North Carolina, which is near the house where my mother and uncle grew up. My mother migrated with my father to New Jersey and my uncle Johnny migrated to Chicago and then Los Angeles, as did many fleeing the oppressive racism of Southern segregation. They brought with them a rich culture of making things, of making a way out of no way. And I've written that, quote, Home places can travel like people in packages. Any place you collect objects of remembrance, model ships and family photographs, or practices rituals of everyday life, cook fried fish from old recipes or make lye soap, all of these things serve as spiritual entrees back to one's home place." Unquote. So my uncle Johnny eventually settled in LA in the 1960s and joined a cadre of artists that included Betty Saar, David Hammonds, Noah Purifoy and others who made revolutionary artistic statements from the detritus of the Watts Rebellion of 1965. He built full-scale installations that found beauty in urban blight. With architect and photographer Peter Tolkien, 
we wrote a piece called Catfish and Coltrane, a conversation about making a home site. We spoke with my uncle, John, about how he made art of every, out of everyday life, which became the architecture of his studio. The culinary is also an art, and we shared while we spoke with him the sweetness of grilled catfish while being serenaded by the soulful sounds of John Coltrane. This is a studio, a rather nondescript building in South Central Los Angeles. And the doors, the way in which he made doors, the way the windows were framed by the aesthetics of urban blight, how fragments of rag can be found on an artwork or hanging on a bar in the kitchen. The details are always essential, how material is attached, whether again, it's an artwork or how two pieces of, of cabinet uh, countertop are brought together and notice the asymmetry, the rhythm of the ways in which the screws are, are organized. The space in the studio was deep, as is my Uncle Johnny's legacy. So over the long arc of the Great Migration, thousands of Black Americans like my parents and my Uncle Johnny transformed the places to which they arrived. As my colleague Farrah Griffin writes in her poignant exploration of migration narratives who set you flowing, quote, after leaving the South, the next pivotal moment in the migration narrative is the initial confrontation with the urban landscape. The confrontation with the urban landscape is usually experienced as a change in time, space and technology, as well as different concepts of race relations. This results in a profound change in the way that the mechanics of power work in the city." End quote. So in 1995, I began a partnership, KWA, with Paul Carriou, who teaches at Carleton. Hi, Paul. Um, and one of our er early projects was to explore our familial histories with migration. For several years, we worked on a project called the Away Station, which was a full-scale installation that examined the architectural spaces of urban migration. And we were interested in how migration as a force does not alter urban space in immediately apparent ways. Instead, these transformations occur over time and begin within the confines of domestic spaces. And so we wanted to chart how these communities appear and disappear and thus fail to be registered as monumental urban traces. In these interim home, homes, these way stations, people and migrations establish domiciles that are situated between the memories of the homelands or the home places from which they recently fled and moved and the imaginings and desires of the places they aspire to be. For some, these homes, a hotel room, the residence of a friend or family member, or even a refugee center is a point of transition before return to home or a point on a trans transition along a path of adaptation to a new home. The way the away station collapses these spaces into a dense amalgam of, op of objects brought in transition, furniture, clothing, sentimental objects, and they mingle with newly acquired objects of consumer culture. And these are packed into a dense space in which the rituals of everyday life unfolds. So the away station's 15 towers can be unpacked according to the space in which they inhabit and can adapt like those in migrations to the unpredictable circumstances of sight. As you walk through the away station, recorded narratives also documents the project's journey. As one moves through, migration narratives are replayed describing journeys, processes of mig migration into the city where the project is exhibited. So for example, in New York, we interviewed Magda, a Hungarian Jew who wisely left Vienna with her husband in the mid 1930s. Jerry and Jean Uric, Haitians who fled the wrath of Duvalier's regime. Ellen was an undocumented Filipino woman. And we also spoke with a Black American male, my father, who fled the segregated South 
in search of opportunities for his family. For San Francisco, we interviewed a Chinese American man who left his home in China in 1915. We also spoke with a Colombian woman who migrated to San Francisco from Peru, seeking independence for herself and her family. And for Los Angeles, we interviewed my uncle Johnny about his, west, his journey westward from North Carolina to Los Angeles via Chicago. As an architectural representation, the away station plum, the, the physical and the psychological realm of these interim homes. Re-memory. My colleague, Saidiya Hartman in Venus in Two Acts writes, quote, I want to tell you a story about two girls capable of retrieving what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present, without committing further violence in my own act of narration. It is a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives an intent on achieving an impossible goal, redressing the violence that produced the numbers, ciphers, fragments of discourse, which is as close as we come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved." End quote. So how do we build space places for remembering the past from the archives and sites of slavery, which still bear the traces of the physical, epistemic, and ontological violence of enslavement? The African burial ground in New York City is a rediscovered 17th and 18th century slave cemetery, which dates back to the Dutch and was located outside of what then was Manhattan's defensive wall. As a major port, New York City at the time was one of the largest slaveholding re regions in the British colonies. The original burial of the dead was clandestine since the burial ground was outside the city wall and enslaved Africans were given permission to bury only after dark. As archeological studies have revealed, rituals of burial still reflected diverse African cultures and practices. The bodies were buried with heads facing east, cowrie shells, pins uh, to usher the dead were placed with, with the buried to usher the dead into the next life. On the five acre site of the original cemetery, only a fragment was extant. The cemetery remained mostly invisible, undisturbed as itself was buried under 25 feet of earth until it was quote, discovered in the late eighties when the federal government was digging foundations for a very tall office building. A divisive battle erupted between the coalitions of community groups and politicians and the Government Services Administration, which was pressured to halt the removal of the remains. The logic was if you remove the remains, the site was no longer a historical site. And it was an important coalition of activists who st stopped that disinterment. The 400 remains that were exhumed have been studied and were at the time Re, uh, the, these photographs were taken at the time we're, we're awaiting reinterment. Paul and I became finalists for a competition for a memorial uh, uh, on the site of the African burial ground. It was a process that lasted uh, more than six years. Our project, Sacred Ground, made a visible presence of this buried history by forging a gathering space for the descendants of New York's, and I mean descendants in quotes, because we don't know specifically, you know, who their descendants might be, but descendants in the symbolic sense of New York's enslaved community. And we created a place for new and old rituals. So unlike the former landscape of toil, this landscape became a space of rest and reflection. It is a place for, of the undisturbed. We worked together with landscape architect Walter Hood to imagine the site as a garden whose modern caretakers would not only tend the grounds of native and medicinal plants, 
but also tend to the memory of the African ancestors. Made of transparent and colored bricks cast out of glass, the spirit catcher forms a bridge between the city and the sacred ground. The spirit catcher also marks a threshold between descendants and their ancestors. We wanted to fashion a space that recalls the bonfires that were lit to provide illumination and thus formed an interior enclosure, a space of communal bonding and a home for both the living and the dead. But there are other histories that are invisible and lay buried. When it opened in 1826, the University of Virginia's 10 pavilions housed faculty and family. Its lawn rooms bordered 125 white male students and its verdant swath of the terrace lawn was crowned by the majestic rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. And his plans for the academical village, Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, third president of the United States, plantation owner and owner of 600 enslaved men and women over the course of his lifetime, brought together an exclusive community in an environment he designed as he wrote to be conducive to quote, to health, to study, to manners, morals and order, end quote. But what until recently remained silent in the official historical narratives about UVA's antebellum period from 1817 to 1865 was mention of the academical village's dependency on an equal number of roughly 150 at one time enslaved men, women, and children. And as we see here, a woman is taking care of one of the children of the, the professors of the pavilion. That history hid in plain sight for 155 years. In 2007, UVA's Board of Visitors, it's like their Board of Trustees, authorized the installation of a plaque in the floor of a walkway in front of the rotunda, co-equal with the recognition that they give to white craftsmen and builders who worked on the university. This plaque had unintended consequences of sparking student outrage. This hidden history became even more tangible to the community when archaeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves behind the Universal's official cemetery. These unmarked graves are thought to be the graves of the, what they would call at the time, servants, the euphemism for the enslaved, that were referenced in reminiscences by former students in the late 19th century. A, cere a ceremony of memorialization that began in the community and that ended in the cemetery recognized those lives. It was a student effort that pressured the university to build a memorial for the enslaved in memory of the enslaved laborers. And so in 2016, I joined with architects Mijin Yoon and Eric Howler, advocate, uh, activist and conflict mediator, Frank Dukes, you see him on the right, uh, Mijin's on the left, um, and landscape architect Gray Bleem to win the commission to design the memorial to enslaved laborers at UVA, which opened this past spring. Brooklyn-based artist Eto Otatigbe, and you see him here, uh, joined us a year later. Uh, and so the image of Mijin is actually in our first charrette in uh, Howler and Yoon's Boston offices, and it gives you a kind of sense of the kinds of references that we were we're, we're looking at um, to start to frame the design of the, the project. But as you can see um, on the left, um, uh, on the top, um, a very compressed timeline of our intensive engagement process. Um, and that was the kind of first period that led to our meeting with the Board of Visitors to improve the design. So over the course of about six months, we engaged multiple stakeholders on their turf, going to classrooms at UVA with students and alumni, 
to local community members at the Jefferson School's African American Heritage Center, to local historic African American churches, and to, and to the presidential homes of Jefferson and Madison to talk to members of the descendants of those who were enslaved in those plantations. And in engaging these multiple communities, what we heard was that the memorial needed to tell the unvarnished truth about the past in order to have legitimacy, that it needed to bring the community together to both learn and reflect on that history, and that it needed to express dualities, not only pain and suffering, but also resilience, dignity, and the humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, it needed to be a living memorial, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that the work of this commemorative landscape remains incomplete. We heard, for example, that, quote, as a black American, I feel an internal pride of gazing upon every brick, every pillar, and every garden at the university, and knowing that this fraught path has birthed an undeniably beautiful present. So we must feel beauty, pride, and gratitude and this would be at the memorial. And it was important to really have that sense of the tactility and the materiality, right, of, of how the university had been built. Along with collecting aspirations and recognizing the kind of materiality of the built environment, hearing about desired meanings and experiences and stories that needed to be told. As part of our design process, we also researched black uh, traditions and gathering, spaces of gathering. As part of our design process, we looked for cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into our design. We explored, for example, how people gather to perform ring shouts, a low country ecstatic dance that moves in a circle whose rhythms and movement collect, connect to West African practices. We heard in outreach meetings that the memorial needed to forge a connection with the community. In response, and after careful study, we cited the memorial in an area known as the Triangle of Grass, a threshold to the campus or grounds, making it visible and accessible to the wider Charlottesville community. The memorial joins a local commemorative landscape. Its circular um, lawn uh, and this of the, the memorial was designed to be a gathering place for events such as the yearly Freedom and Liberation Day March that happens on March 3rd, which is tomorrow, that remembers the day that Union troops liberated the 14,000 enslaved persons in Albemarle County, where Charlottesville is located. The memorial is cited in dialogue with the rotunda, which sits on the highest point of the lawn, which Jefferson placed at a ridgeline of a hill upon which the university grounds were built. The careful terracing of the lawn and section allowed Jefferson to create pavilions that were two stories on the lawn, but three stories on the garden, garden side, creating a lower level walkout basement, which housed spaces for the labor of the enslaved. The spaces behind the pavilions, enclosed by the famous serpentine walls, were in fact work yards, where enslaved labor, the enslaved labored to chop woods, haul water, slaughter animals, and wash laundry. Jefferson understood slavery to be abhorrent and employed architecture and the architectural section to conceal it. The memorial architecture in contrast works to reveal, to open and to invite, utilizing the landscape in the section to create an open bowl like figure in contrast to the closed sphere of the rotunda, both 80 feet in diameter. And so you get a sense here of that sort of welcoming embrace, the low walls rising to contain the space um, of those who visit the memorial. The conical intersection creates a series of nested rings offering multiple layers that unfold the stories of the enslaved. The center holds a gathering space which is inscribed by an inner ring that holds the timeline of historical events. The next layer of the ring creates a concave surface of remembrance, and the outer convex surface creates a canvas for expression. These rings speaks, each of these rings speaks to a different layer of history, meaning, and interpretation. To develop the layers of history in the memorial, we work closely with a group of committed historians. 
and whose thoughtful examination of UVA's enslaved community and the history of, the, of slavery at the university produced rich material. To name names, to tell the story of the enslaved community required that we engage with an archive of work ledgers seen here and personal letters of slave owners. As such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silences and violence. The university owned maybe two to three slaves in the antebellum period. It rented the majority of workers to build the university and to take care of the grounds. However, professors owned slaves who cleaned, cooked, and took care of families and maintained the classrooms where students learned. And the hotel owners, where the student, students ate, also owned enslaved people who cooked, served, and cared for, and cleaned the student rooms. Now, historians estimate that about 4,000 men, women, and children built, labored, and lived at UVA from 1817 to 1865, but we know very little details about their lives. But all are recognized in the memorial by what we call memory marks, which are arrayed across the inner arc of the memorial. So there are 4,000 of these memory marks. For most, for most, that is 3,111 persons to be exact, the archives did not record a first or last name. As the spreadsheet on the right shows um, that we found records for 889 persons, but not all records recorded names. And sometimes there were just a citation like three Negro hands who were hired or rented. Now, of those 889 references, we know mostly the first name of 577 community members. For a handful of people, like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, or Henry Martin, we know a first and a last name. But for the remaining 311 recorded persons, kinship relationships and occupations remember their lives. The result of this research and in conversation with the descendant community, yielded the design of a genealogical cloud of the enslaved community that stretches in a quasi-chronological order across the inner surface of the memorial. And as you walk in, you become developed by this cloud of names and relationships. The list of names, a traditional feature of Western memorials, reimagines social relationships and rehumanizes the experience of the enslaved. And as a result, visitors engage Henry, Isabella, Jane, Jack, Robert, Randall, as families of sisters, grandmothers, uncles, and friends, as workers who took pride in their work as woodcutters, janitors, laundresses, and fiddlers. Carved into the granite, the 4,000 memory marks speak back, sometimes with tears, to their descendants and to us. The tactility of the granite draws us to it, to touch and to be touched. The names remembering the enslaved across from a bench with a timeline and water feature that captures the attentions of visitors who learn a different history of the university. In contrast to the wall of marks and names which rises and inclines outward, a shallow near level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. Positioned just below the knee, visitors lean in, almost bowing in a, in a bowing posture to read the entries along the timeline. The 17 entries inscribed into the water table begin with the arrival of the enslaved to Virginia in 1619 and ends with the passing of Isabella Gibbons in 1890. It covers the arrival of the 10 enslaved laborers to clear the land that would become UVA in 1817 and covers a history of transactions, work, and violence. In reference to the libation rituals and the currents of rivers that carried people to freedom, a steady stream of shallow water washes over the entire arc of the timeline. Isabella Gibbons, a teacher and a founder of the Freedman School, which became the Jefferson School in Charlottesville. She is the only member of the enslaved community at, at UVA from which the archives have yielded a full name, a first and a last name, a date of death, a photograph, and a brief written record of her experiences. 
She serves as a witness for her community, and this is what she remembers. Quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping posts, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trading, trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not, or ever will." End quote. And this appears in the memorial on the end of the historical timeline. Artist Eto Otatigbe became interested in the layering of the information we had gleaned from conversations from historic sites like Mont Pelier, Daughters of Zion Cemetery, seen here on the right, in the archives, such as the rare photographs of enslaved people. Rough tombstones, like here, um, at the Daughters of Zion African American burial ground. Um, and we see the kind of vertical quarry marks in the stone that would have been worked by skilled masons. We are looking at a close-up of the photograph of Isabella Gibbon's eyes. The original image is in the archives of the Boston Public Library. She was enslaved by mathematics professor William Barton Williams, who would actually move to Boston to go on to found MIT. To realize this relief image in stone, we had to develop a unique process and customize software. We worked with great fabricators, core stone, in Madison, Wisconsin. First, we needed to translate the intensity of data from the photograph to a virtual model. And then we generated a machine tool path to create a virtual surface that was overlaid onto a digital model of the memorial's curved surface. All of this took place digitally, working with remote teams before Quora cut into the stone. And you see here the sort of different series, right, of the kind of markings. Um, the, the, the lenticular marking of the eyes and the sort of bush hammered marking of the surface, both which are visible on the kind of outer surface of the memorial. So now we see uh, a part of the memorial's exterior surface engraved with the image of Isabella Gibbon's eyes. And from various positions that we view the memorial and reflect on those it was meant to honor. And so she sort of appears and disappears as this sort of haunting figure of the memorial. The eyes are symbolic of all those who were enslaved and their descendants who witnessed this change and hopefully more positive change for um, the black community. This, this engagement continues to make this a living memorial. As construction began at UVA, we hired a genealogist, Shelley Murphy, seen here on the right, to trace the descendants of the enslaved whose names have been discovered by historians and inscribed upon the walls of the memorial. Here we have pictures of two descendants. In the middle is Detisa Gathers, and on the, on the left is Colleen Yates, who are local activists and leaders in the descendant community. Colleen is also part of the descendant community of, of Monticello, which overlaps uh, with UVA as uh, professors bought enslaved people after Thomas Jefferson died and Jefferson's uh, children sold off enslaved people to pay off the debts of Monticello. The memorial's reflective and inscribed surfaces, its paths and gathering spaces, commemorate a community of black men, women, and children who lived lives, who worked, played, weeped, died, escaped, resisted, and refused enslavement together. By remembering their suffering, their dignity, their freedom, as did the protest days after the construction fence was removed, organized by UVA's medical student schools, White Coats for Black Lives, who took the knee for eight minutes and 40 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd, a gruesome reminder that the violence and injustices persist today in the wake of slavery. The memorial for enslaved laborers to UVA came into fruition through a collective desire to face the past, to reckon with the truth, including the horrible cruelties, as Gibbons' quote on the timeline describes, with Isabella Gibbons as a witness for and the watcher of her community, the memorial brings together their lives, known and unknown, to ours.
nobility. For Toni Morrison, it is not technology that is the hallmark of modernity, but migration. With the transatlantic slave trade commencing one of the longest and largest forced migrations in human histories, whose trails are still followed by the circuits of global trade uh, and capitalism. And a photo video project, again with architect and photographer Peter Tolkien, um, he and I wanted to examine African modernism. What curator, the late curator and theorist Okwe and Weezer has argued accomplishes modernity in a different manner. He says, quote, to begin with this modernism, that is African modernism, it's not founded on an ideology of the universal, nor is it based on the recognition and assimilation of an autonomous European modernism or on the continuity of the epistemic field of artistic territorialization achieved and consecrated by the colonial project, end quote. We decided to take up in Weezer's charge and look closely at African modernism, more specifically the modern architecture of Ghana. But this raised many questions about how African is this architecture really, since most of it was designed by non-Ghanaians. What were the stories of modernity to be learned from looking not only at these works, but also their context? Were there stories of other modernisms to be heard? So in here you see a, uh, um, a scene from a conversation uh, with me and Peter, uh, my colleague Felicity Scott, and uh, historian Ikema Koye discussing our exhibition, uh, listening there, scenes from Ghana that was shown at Studio X, both in New York and also Studio X, X Rio. As outsiders, Peter and I asked ourselves, rather than look, what if we listened instead? So this grid of photographs depicts two single family residents for Ghanaian elites from the early 1960s. The upper left side, a residence for a prominent businessman from, the 1960, from 1962 by British architects uh, Nixon and Boris. The owner, Mr. Pe Peppera, took us to meet one of the architects who at the time still practiced in Accra. On the bottom of the grid are two pictures of the private residence of architect Kenneth Scott and his wife, and uh, we see that on the left. And then we see his wife here, um, who is a former Ghanaian diplomat and now judge. Um, we photographed um, and visited the American embassy, which has been decommissioned and modified. And it now houses the Ministry of uh, Women and Children's Affairs. Uh, it was designed by Harry Weiss and Associates in 1956. So when approaching the building whose roofs had been modified, like a lot of modern flat roof buildings because of inadequate drainage and extreme tropical weather, Peter and I were most in awe of the spatial openness of the base. The lifting of the building on its unique structure of pilotis makes the entire base public and open to visitors. It's symbolic of a post-war approach to diplomacy, a new internationalism that was undertaken with the recalibrations of old empires. However, as we know, by the mid-1960s, American involvement in places like the Congo at the behest of corporate interests would be responsible for the downfall of these first democratically elected regimes. Perhaps it is fitting that this decommissioned embassy has been adapted for use as a ministry for women's affairs. And when passing by the new American embassy in Accra, our driver insisted that it was so heavily fortified that we were unable to take pictures. In 50 short years, the U.S.'s architectural approach had transformed from communication and dialogue with others to one of disconnect and control. Um, here are three additional images. This is actually from our last group of images in the exhibition. And it's a cross section through, through time and space of what we saw. The first image of photographs is the courtyard of Primpe Primpa College in Kumasi, designed by the firm uh, Fry, Drew and Associates in 1955 and 54. And it was a school de originally designed to educate 450 boys and is still used as a school for young boys and girls. In a way, it shows its kind of programmatic resilience. In the middle, the slave dungeons from Elmina Castle, one of the Gold Coast slave forts, shows a Ghanaian tourist observing the interior. 
As my colleague Saidiya Hartman eloquently articulates in Lose Your Mothers, which Peter and I both read, um, Saidiya recounts in Lose Your Mother her journey her journey from research into her own African roots in a Yale, Yale's Beinecke Library to a stay in uh, millennial Ghana, where nobody had much time for old narratives. Is it possible to return home, she asked. Time has irrevocably transformed both worlds. And our last photo shows the MTN branch office in a busy district of Osu in Accra. MTN, a South African country, is one of the major mobile phone providers in Ghana and elsewhere on the African continent. At every corner, in the towns and cities we visit, visited, were peppered with cellular, cellular communication networks with brightly colored kiosks vending phone cards. This emerging architecture of the street signifies a new infrastructure of architecture that is global, uh, architecture of a global aesthetic that implants itself anywhere in any city. The logics of high modernism and international style recalibrated. We listened and heard many stories, perhaps many different modernisms in Ghana, other modernisms in Africa. For the exhibition, African Mobilities, in Pomasipa Road, this exhibition, African Mobilities, also explores how freedom remains a scarce and unequally distributed commodity, and how the freedom to move is increasingly becoming a principal stratifier in the long durée of modernity, coloniality, coloniality, and neoliberal capitalism. In 2012, I co-founded Global Africa Lab with my colleague Mario Gooden to explore the spatial topologies of, African, of the African continent and its diaspora. A pedagogical and research project, GAL as we call it, has done workshops, exhibitions, and research projects in a host, with a host of collaborators, including MIT Media Labs, uh, Carson Smuts, Cape Town architect and educator Mokena Mokeka, and curator, scholar, and urbanist Mpo Matsipa. Our various contexts for this work included Johannesburg, Cape Town, Rio, Salvador de Bahia, Detroit, New York City, Dakar, Harare, and Praia, Cape Verde, to name a few of the sites of our collaborations. And in 2017, we were invited by Mpo to contribute to her groundbreaking uh, exhibition, African Mobilities, This Is Not a Refugee Camp, which most recently includes a second iteration podcast to which we also contributed. For the pedagogical part of African Mobilities, Impoa asked us to organize a workshop on the themes of our project, Immobility and the Afro-Imaginary. And we gathered together students across programs at GSAP and also from schools in New York City. The day ended with a public discussion at Gavin Brown's Enterprise in Harlem with a really great group of interlocutors, including the Black Chalk Collective, um, artist, American artist, and Justin Garrett Moore, who gave a lecture earlier this semester um, 
as part of this series. The workshop proved impactful, actually, for the students, and shortly thereafter our event, they organized GSAP's Black Student Alliance to acknowledge the necessity of collective action in forging a space of blackness in the fields of the built environment. As noted, Impose intent was to create a kind of counter cartography of the hegemonic discourse of displacement and crisis associated with the mobilities of black bodies on the continent and within the diaspora. We were invited to imagine speculative futures crafted out of the precarity forged by colonial and neoliberal legacies across the globe. I'm going to share with you a bit of our um, two channel video.
So for black Americans under Jim Crow, the public space in the 1920th century was inaccessible most of the time. But there were moments such as pageants, parades, and protests, as we saw in this previous project, when public space was being claimed. So the project I'm going to talk about next, Marching on the Politics of Performance, explores the histories, driving forces, and legacy of marching and organized forms of performance. It was commissioned in 2017 by Storefront for Art and Architecture. And Bryony Roberts and I um, created a research project and exhibition that explores the crucial role of um, the community's collective movements as both acts of cultural expression and political um, resistance. Our collaborators were the contemporary youth performance group, the Marching Cobras of New York City. The Cobras are a Harlem-based after-school drumline and dance uh, uh, team that continue early traditions of, of parades and marching. We discussed with the Cobras um, uh, the history um, of their art form, because many of them were unfamiliar of its, 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 its um, origins. And they asked us very difficult questions like, quote, what, what was lynching? Um, with us, they shared their stories about why they joined the Cobras, with many starting as early as six or seven years old, and remaining with the group into their early 20s. The Cobra offered um, many of them a creative medium that challenged the criminalization of black youth in public space. And on the right, you see Kevin and, and um, Terrell, um, who are the leaders of the Cobras and are also our collaborators. Um, we shared with them the history of the Silent March organized against racial violence by Du Bois and also um, the Harlem Hellfighters, um, a black unit who fought nobly along French troops in World War II when racist American troops refused to fight with them and whose talented musicians like James Rouse brought jazz to Europe. And when they returned home, um, even though to a country that saw them less than human, they had a remarkable parade um, through New York City in 1919, also up Fifth Avenue. We showed them how and why black people took to the streets to be in public an implicit protest against white supremacy and anti-black racism. We showed how the marching cobras pay tribute to the exuberance and flares of drum lines from back in the day and of marching bands of the HBCUs. We collaborated uh, with Terrell Stowers, the founding director, and Kevin Young, the lead choreographer, to develop an opening sequence of tight linear formations that echoed the historical strides and cadences of marching. Rehearsing these traditional steps and drills was a new experience for the Cobras, one that delved into the history of, of these gatherings and its connection to political protest. Um, here you see Bryony, um, um, we worked on costumes um, for the drummers and dancers that echoed both the Harlem Hellfighters and the silent protest. The drummers represented the Hellfighters and wore olive shirts and pants. Um, the dancers, in contrast, were all white, alluding to the, to the women who, and children who walked in the silent protests. Marcus Garvey Park, the site of performance, um, uh, is the site of a long-standing institution of its Saturday drum circle, which anyone can join and observe. But now that Harlem is undergoing rapid gentrification, high-end real estate, and new condo buildings surrounding the park brought, brings noise complaints from new residents, particularly about the drum circle. So Marching On called attention to this community history and the importance of performance as a means of claiming public space in this transitioning and still contentious sites. So we presented Marching On in Marcus Garvey Park in 2017 in partnership with the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance and as part of um, Performa 17, the sort of bi, um, uh, uh, biannual performance um, uh, uh, gathering. So we made a lot of noise and folks came out. I'm going to just share a very short clip of the performance to give you a sense of what we did.
So that gives you a sense of the performance that we worked on with the Cobras. And so four months after the live performance, we opened an exhibition at Storefront for Art and Architecture and presented Marching On's historical material that provided the basis for the performance and displayed the capes we designed accompanied by two videos um, about the performance, part of which you just saw. We also hung uh, artist Jenica Heinzelman's point, uh, portraits of the costume cobras in the park to really draw out the unique individual characters that comprised both the act and celebrate black youth's talents and aspirations. For the exhibition's opening, the Cobras performed a rousing, to a rousing crowd of over 100 spectators on narrow Kinmare Street in lower, the Lower East Side, where the gallery um, is located. They performed, however, without a legal permit, since there was still, in this neighborhood, resistance to these sounds. But we marched on. And lastly, I just want to mention very briefly, the. Um, the exhibition Reconstructions, uh, Architecture and Blackness in America that opened this past Saturday at the Museum of Modern Art that I co-curated with Sean Anderson along with Ariel Dion Krosnick and Anna Burkhart who are our curatorial assistants. The legacy of slavery as we've seen uh, shapes the built environment and you could see that legacy and the HOLC maps. These were maps done by um, uh, banks and real estate and the federal government um, that sort of graded the value of land um, for, for loans. And so here's a map of Queens, redlining map in the 1930s. Um, the impoverishment of redlining produced an imprint that can still be seen in the overlay of a COVID map and that redlining map. Um, and this was done by Studio Ant um, for the field guide, the catalog for the show. And yet amidst the degradation of white supremacy, black peoples found beauty, dignity, joy, and community. And so for reconstructions, we brought together 11 architects, designs, and artists to make projects exploring blackness and the legacies of anti-black racism in cities and towns around the US. And you could see the map here, you see Mario was working uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and the map also includes in green, um, uh, all black towns that were settled in the period of reconstruction. We asked participants in the show to consider scales of body, scales of kitchen, of neighborhood, of community, spaces of remembrance, knowledge, refusal, ritual, grief, and sites, New York City, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, Nashville, Syracuse, Oakland, St. Louis, which became Kinloch, Atlanta, and Miami. So here we see Mario Gooden's protest machine um, uh, for Nashville. Uh, in the background is Yolanda Daniels, Black City, LA. Here's Lake Giuffus, Frozen Neighborhoods, Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, we see to the right, um, Felicia Davis's Fabricating Network, Hill District, Pittsburgh, Amanda Williams, we're not down there, we're over here about Kinloch, Missouri. Um, Sekou Cooks, we out here uh, for Syracuse and Jermaine Barnes in the back, Spectrum of Blackness, Miami, uh, with his deconstructed spice rack. Black Reconstructions Collective, which formed out of the, uh, the, the exhibition with the group of the, the 10 uh, artists, designers, and architects, um, produced a powerful manifesting statement that commits to, quote, continuing 
this work of reconstruction in black America, end quote, and creates a new threshold to the galleries of MoMA and to the exhibition. Blackness was there at the opening in all of its beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'd now like to invite Professors Mokena Makeka and Mario Gooden to initiate a, a, a dialogue and a response to the work that Mabel just shared. And I'll also invite all of our audience members to deposit any questions you might have in the Q&A. And just a quick reminder to please use the Q&A function and not the chat as it is disabled in, in the webinar. Um, and as we proceed, I'll read questions aloud, time permitting, of course, uh, to give a, a sense of voice and presence in our virtual reality. Um, so Mabel, thank you again. And Mario and Mokena, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Zach. And thank you, Mabel, um, uh, for that uh, fantastic lecture. Uh, I'm going to actually pass it to my to our good friend, Mokena. Um, just seeing what time it is there in, in Cape Town, we'll, we'll let you have the, have the first word. Mabel and I have an ongoing conversation, so um, we'll let you have the, the first word this evening. Well, well, well thank you very much, but I, I will say this much. As much as I was uh, exhausted before the presentation, I am super energized right now. Thank you, uh, thank you. Professor Wilson, for an amazing presentation. Uh, very insightful. Um, good to also get um, more nuances and some of the work that I thought I already knew. Um, but at the same time, to also see some of the more recent work. Uh, in fact, I've got so much to say that I need to be disciplined, Zach, and um, maybe just point out one or two things and allow the conversation to flow. So um, there, were a, there were a number of highlights in your presentation for me, uh, Mabel, if I can call you that. I mean, the first one was when you referred to yourself as being undisciplined. And I thought that that was an interesting word that you used because you spoke about multiple media, multiple forms of discipline in terms of how you express architecture. But even there, the way that you begin to play on language and deconstruct language and, and in, in, in some sense, begin to form new, um, new syntaxes, new vocabularies, I think is a common thread throughout your work. Um, and as you were speaking, I, I recalled, um, you know, Chinua Achebe, the, the African writer who was once asked, um, you know, why does he not write in his indigenous language? And his response was that um, there's a difference between a national language versus an ethnic language and that the ethnic language, yes, it could communicate in one particular datum or, or, or stratum, but the, 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 the so-called national language is about how do you communicate across boundaries and so on. Um, how do you transgress? You know, how do you escape the discipline of the ethnic and become something larger? Now, architecture, as, as you well know, um, is afflicted with this, with this challenge. On, on the one hand, it is highly specific and highly local, climate, labor, et cetera. But at the same time, it, it is part of a much larger discourse that's, that's in some respects global, right? Um, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about that and perhaps connected to this question of modernity and tradition, um, because particularly for the students who, who are out there grappling with this notion about the local versus the specific uh, America versus Canada, South Africa, you know, how do we begin to build bridges where we can transgress and in an undisciplined way, find new forms of discipline around the language of design. So, and, and I've got lots to speak about, but, but I think um, the way that you've made me think differently about language um, um, I'm certainly curious to hear about, you know, what are your thoughts about modernity tradition and this question of a universal discourse versus a very specific, um, localized and let's say place specific approach. Yeah, no, thank you, Mokena, for that incredibly thoughtful. I don't know if I could <laughs> come up with something that thoughtful, um, uh, you know, early in the, early, early in the morning, um, but no, I mean, you're absolutely spot on because that Toni Morrison essay, Black Matter, she talks specifically about Chinua Achebe. And, you know, the way, the, 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 the question of like, what is he writing? What language is he writing in, right? Is it, is it English, right? Is it the colonial language? Or, you know, is it his indigenous language, which has a 
whole other expression, right? Um, Frantz Fanon says something very similar, white skin, black masks about, um, uh, about French, right? And what happens yeah, when, yeah. You, when you occupy the French language and you travel to Paris and you become pos cosmopolitan and a ki the kind of disjuncture that emerges precisely because blackness is a, is a negation. It's conceptualized and signified as a negation in the kind of um, language and the significations, right, of like modern modern being. And that's why I get into the question, I've been thinking about this a lot, the epistemic, right, and bodies of knowledge and the ontological, right, and even maybe those terms are problematic because they're Western. But, um, you know, and, 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 and so to sort of think about how to, how to maybe be a little unruly and undisciplined sort of allows you to then sort of move um, outside of the table, right? The taxonomy, like the way of re that reason tries to order, order, organize the kind of modern world of which the Western art of building that we call architecture is a part of. Because I always tell my students, people build all over the world in different ways that don't need an architect, don't need a drawing, and don't need a permit, right? Um, don't use sections, don't use plans. And so Buildings always exist, but architecture is a very specific formation that comes out of the West. And I've just come to realize it runs parallel with the colonial project of the West. So that's why I find that it's so entangled, like with all of these like questions of like, how do you decolonize a body of knowledge? And that would include architecture, right? And certainly in the art his architectural historical circles, right, that I engage in, that's certainly like, how do you you know, how do you teach an anti-racist architectural history? How do you decolonize, right? Yeah. Um, the architectural survey, right? But I think that goes true with the, the kind of language that we work with um, in in architecture. And, and that's certainly one dimension of it, if that answers your question. Well, if, if, if I may uh, briefly follow up on that, um, because um, at the very beginning, just kind of going back to Toni Morrison, um, you did sort of cite, you know, race matters, and that, and, and Morrison writes that she desires to sort of carve away at American English, and you presented tonight not only carving but assemblage, uh, collage, collapsing, if you will, as, um, as uh, I suppose we could call these perhaps methodologies, if you weigh in terms of, or ways of being undisciplined. But it also made me wonder, and I've been having this conversation with another friend of ours, Kwasi Dyson, the, the painter, um, about um, rupture and madness and insanity. Um, and you know, at what point, let's say, does, you showed us uh, the epilogue from The Bluest Eye, in which all of the space gets squeezed out, mm. the little girl becomes, uh, she goes insane, she becomes mad. But the I guess I'm interested in the in the way in which let's say rupture or madness might be productive. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to, you know, out of that maybe to create your lecture title is called a black study. I'm wondering about a black episteme. Hmm. Hmm. Ooh. <laughs> Deep. I need a drink for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, 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 it was fun because I got to, I taught Torquasi, um, I, I taught her black compositional thought with Tina, with um, Christina Sharps in the wake in my pro seminar for black studies last semester. You know, and I like the way in which she, you know, thinking about like a way of making. Um, that that is black, and you know this idea of black compositional thought, I, I find really provocative. And yeah, I mean that's the thing about the project of modernity based on reason. You see this, you know, just in Nietzsche. I mean, he just kind of realized like madness is it is just part of the project. Like that's what fascinates me about like Jefferson. Like how do you write a Declaration of Independence and freedom? And then say, excuse me, enslaved person, can you bring me like a cup of, you know, Madeira? Like, how do you, like, how do you live with that? And I know you can live with a lot of contradictions in life, but that seems so profound to your ethos. And I think, but that's the trick 
that's the problem with the, the, the modern project. It's just fraught. I mean, as Norbesi yeah. Philip says, like with the logic is illogic, right? Um, with the rational is always the irrational. Like it's like, you know, a, a different side of the same coin. And, and, and I think we have to recognize the kind of shaky ground that reason in fact is constructed on. And, and to be, which isn't to say that reason is bad, but do we have to make a, a God of it? And I mean that in all the kind of like, patriarchal dimensions of God. <laughs> um, sure. And so, you know, are there, you know, there are clearly other ways of knowing the world and other ways of being in the world before the West invented, right? The liberal subject, right? And that's part of the reason why for me, Studio And is so unruly in architecture, because it's like, I'll work with anybody, I and anyone, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not trying to promote genius, like individual genius. I mean, it's such a problem or I would say challenge that when Meijin and Eric were the architects of record for the memorial, but we have been adamant that this was like a six way project, right? There were six of us who like, you can't point to anything in that project and say that's so-and-so because we were all involved in all of the conversations about making. And yet the architectural press insist, even after we tell them Haller and Yoon's memorial, when it, you know, it's not. And maybe we should have done, you know, kind of what Max Bond and Phil Freeland and David Audrey did was, you know, form fabs, right? Which nobody remembers. <laughs> but that was the entity that essentially built the African-American Museum with the Smith, Smith Group. They were the S. Um, and that's a problem because of this idea of liberal individualism, right? Which then comes through as individual genius. Um, and, and the self is still, it's, it's predicated on all sorts of, mythologies about, you know, I can go it alone, which we can't, we're so dependent on others for, for our survival. And I think that that's important. And that's what I've been learning a lot lately. in these, these larger collaborative projects like the memorial, and also like um, the exhibition, right, that collectivity, yeah. we made an advisory panel, you know, when we realized MoMA's archive wasn't going to be all that helpful in doing this project, we kind of made a, a living archive, right? And and I love that, that you know, the, the 10 of you guys made the BRC, the Black Reconstruction Collective. So rather than seeing yourselves as competitive LLCs, right, grabbing for the crumb, y'all said, no, we're going to, we're going to organize and we're going to like make something collective, right, of mutual aid. And and I think that's a really important ethos to 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 promote. I don't know if that gets to the point that you're trying to make. Well, I, I'd like to build on your response as well as um, you know Mary's question because I actually do think there's there's a neat correlation between the text that you showed where it's compressed and and there's no punctuation and it's almost a form of madness, if you will, and compare that to conditions where through you know, migration narratives, people have to give up parts of themselves and only pick up certain rituals or certain pieces. So you end up with what I call a broken language. And what I found remarkable about your memorial is that it was maybe the equivalent of putting in commas, putting in full stops, putting in gaps into the story, uh, the broader story of, of, of enslavement and, and forgetfulness, if you will, about the forgotten people there. So there is something to be said, I would argue about the complete narrative, whether that's reason or not, is something else. But I think we live in a world of 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 jumbled discourse, where there's an absence of pause, an absence of refle of reflection, incomplete sentences, incomplete communication. And I think our role as architects and urbanists today is to create those pause spaces where we can make sense of the madness, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it we are living in illogical sort of conditions. So I, I thought that your the memorial was actually quite stunning in that sense because of the different ways in which it caused you to not only physically pause, but also intellectually reflect in a, in a much more engaged way about um, the legacy of Jefferson in, in, amongst many other sorts of issues. So I, I, do, I do see a connectedness there. Um, uh, would, would you like to comment on this idea of um, spiritual entrees? You know, I, I, just to quote you, I wrote down, you said a culture of traveling um taking knowledge and rituals with you i mean I'm, i was just intrigued by that because i thought it was a really beautiful way of describing how does one find home how does one find belonging how does one find uh, identity and we have to often we don't have we don't have the opportunity to have the full buffet we have to pick up the entrees and somehow create our own meals our own discourses 
Um, um, and at the end, the, the marching presentation was very much in that sort of vein. So I just, just, just your thoughts about the sort of incomplete nature of, of narratives and, and, and what is our role today as, as architects and storytellers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea that you bring, you know, you bring knowledge with you, you bring, you know, and oftentimes when you don't have a lot or when you have to, you know, you, you, you bring, you know, things that have, you know, we thought about it, you know, like things that might have some sentimental value. You think bring things that you know you, you absolutely might might need, but you, you can't bring bring everything, right? And so like, what is it? And, and then how do you have this kind of like improvised um, existence, you know, perhaps staying with a friend or, um, and, you know, I mean, I think that's important in terms of, you know, because I think it challenges the kinds of, um, you know, the, the kind of um, subjectivity is right of, um, you know, that, that get promulgated certainly through consumerism, right? You know, like you, yeah. you want that single yeah. family house so you can fill it with all the stuff that you're buying from, you know, who knows where at Walmart or <laughs> wherever, you know, and, you know, but you're, you're playing out a kind of media kind of fantasy and not maybe recognizing, you know, like what's really essential or what's important or what doesn't bond you to like as this kind of virtual, um, space of, 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 you know, consumption, but in, in, in like what connects you perhaps with others. Um, and, and I think that's, that's important. Um, and, you know, in what ways can, you know, can architecture, you know, start to think about its own temporality and its own spatiality in terms of how it, um, it defines that. And, you know, the memorial was a challenge because we realized that the Western memorial form was inadequate. They were like, name names. And we were like, but we don't know names, so how do you do it? They were like, we want a figure. And we weren't, we were like, no, nah, we're not doing bronze. We don't want to do like anonymous bronze enslaved people. That wasn't, right? But that's the expectation, right, of that particular form. And so we had to really, you know, again, kind of we literally carved away, you know, and we talked about like, what does it mean to to show the violence to, you know, and that was part of the earlier conversation that we knew we wanted this sort of textured surface. So like, how do you sort of translate that right to these forms that were given, but they're malleable, right? They're not, yeah. they're, they're not rigid, right? They, they can be taken to somewhere else in a way. I'd like to maybe tie this into a question from Atma Muhado, who asked, I heard your remark on architecture not needing a plan, section, and elevation. I came across this twice, once in a site assessment visit to a Rastafarian village and ghetto in Kingston, and again in studies in architectural conservation in relation to Canada's indigenous. Uh, do you think this concept has a future and if so, how can architecture be represented for small indigenous groups or marginalized people? Uh, uh, is uh, this concept even worth exploring? Um, and I guess what I want to get at is that even though one of the relationships that you made for the memorial to uh, enslaved workers at UVA was yes, in relationship to the rotunda and its 80 feet diameter or what have you, there was something, it seems to me that pre, um, pre exists before the rotunda because that shape, if you will, was also, or let's say encirclement was also in the, uh, your project for the African burial ground. Although in that yeah. case, it was in terms of landscape. Yeah. So it seems to me that, uh, and I don't want to answer Otmar's question, I'm going to throw it to you, but it does seem to me that um, in that case, even though the, there was a reference to the rotunda, that the plan or the dimension wasn't actually necessary, that there was something about encirclement or there's something about that, and, and maybe it is something which gets carried spiritually in terms of gathering, that um, that might be a kind of black episteme or an other way of knowing space yeah. that does not yeah. require a plan. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it, that form is a kind of sensibility. And we, we, you know, we looked at the ring shout. We also imagined it as a kind of broken shackle. 
Uh, I didn't mention it, but the memorial is actually oriented northward, and there is a path um, that Greg, you know, kind of actually designed. So we made this path that goes north to freedom, and there is a stone for every year that people were enslaved, actually, at UVA. So there's a whole other orientation going on in that, and, you know, we thought about the ring shout. I mean, we used to also use the ring shout in, um, we did this animation for the African American Museum with DSR um, that actually has uh, a ring shout that you would see a kind of virtual 3D ring shout in the lobby of the building. And, and then you'd come across actually Saidiya Hartman reading with your mother. So I mean, all these people that I mentioned, Farah and Poe, I mean, uh, you know, they're interlocutors as, as both, you, both of you are in, in this conversation. And so, you know, we, we looked at, we were fascinated with this painting by Alma Thomas that was also in a, in a circle, right? And the way in which she kind of marks, we kept thinking, what if those were gathering or, or people? So we were drawing from, you know, lots of different references. I mean, you could see there was Fred Wilson on the wall, right? In, in Howler and Yoon Studios, we had been looking at that. We, we, we were, were thinking through a number of different references for the project. And in, in terms of the plans and sections, people build all the time without architectural representation. I mean, the key to the plan and the drawing is a way of organizing space, but it also becomes a way of quantifying space. It's it, the, you know, the measurement is also what is able to then translate to the deed, right? So that the site, the property can be abstracted and owned. Um, and, you know, people built, I mean, you know, they didn't necessarily have to make drawings. I mean, so, I mean, they're incredibly meticulous structures around the world without the use of the plan and the section. Right, and that's why, I, and I've been having this conversation with Lewis Nelson, who's a architectural historian at UVA. Like he agrees, like we should just talk about buildings and not architecture, because architecture is the Western art of building, right? And that's why I say people have made buildings and built since humans, right? We're walking, Homo sapiens were walking the earth, but architecture, you know, is what from the kind of the Renaissance onward, and that is the Western arts building. The trick of Western architectural history was to put everything under the umbrella of architecture. So that you would look at a Mayan temple and say that's architecture, but they would not have called it architecture. They might have had a term for whatever it was. So to be, again, conscious of the context of these terms, to turn everything into architecture is the trick of universalism, right? It just becomes everything. So, and so we have to think about the word. And, and that, you know, I learned architectural history from Bannister Fletcher. And whoo, he made, I've talked with my, my architectural history students in my survey, you know, you know like how that drawing that, that, that Fletcher used in turn of the 20th century, you know, just organized, like literally, like the architecture of Peru, Mexico, um, Persia, I'm trying to think of the names they use, all of those people of color who were making it, they, they didn't grow anything, but Greece and Rome and then the Gothic and the Renaissance and then they sprout into the Neo-Gothic and, and at the top of the American version is American architecture shown um, by the um, uh, that McKim Mead and White building and Madison Square, I'm totally blanking on it. But anyway, but, but there's a way in which again in that narrative the West is privileged and literally these other styles are called ahistorical in the version. Right. And so there's a kind of work that architectural history does. And we talk about this work in, in Race and Modern Architecture. So, but really fantastic question. And, and in fact, I want to I want to build on that and, uh, and and ask, did it come up in your discussion about maybe the, the counter argument that by claiming or let's say appropriating these other forms of expression and accommodating them within the pantheon of a different definition of architecture, not the traditional Western one, does that allow for, for scholars and consumers of, of the built environment to engage with indigenous forms of production and see them as the same status as Western architecture, or do you see that appropriation at the expense of its intrinsic values? Yeah. So in other words, is, is there merit in co-opting the term and reshaping mm -hmm. architecture in our own language? That's a really good question. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I would just think, well, would that be true for literature, for, 
you know, the, I mean, these are yeah. all specific forms, right? That then, you know, kind of get, get mel you know, they are parts of specific historical trajectories in the West. So yeah. I don't know, but I, I mean, mean, I think it's a good question. It's a, it's a really yeah. good question. Um, but I, all I, all I, I can I, say is there are other ways of being, and there were other ways of knowing the world prior to the West. Yes, so there must absolutely. be something else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if we're Ab going to survive, and I hate to use the, but I think if we're going to survive as a species, we better find it because we're wiping out our environment that allows us to survive, right? With, with climate catastrophe. And so we have to find other ways of being human together, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, can I ask a very practical, tactical architectural question just to, sure. you know, in, in, in the bush hammered um, facade of the, of the Isabel Gimmons uh, Memorial, um, the eyes were actually uh, digitized, you know, pixelated. So there was a sort of, uh, let's call it advanced technology being used to create the architecture. And I'm wondering, as you're going through the design, was there grappling with uh, you know, the extent to which the hand, because you also spoke about tactility and holding and brickwork on another project, the extent to which you begin to say this is too much technology, yeah. the purpose of this particular, not that, not that specific instance, or actually this is exactly why we need technology in this moment, as opposed to getting, yeah. you know, stonemasons with a sketch and saying, make it happen. I just want to understand also for the benefit of our listeners, how did you make those decisions about, you know, a human hand versus technology, or do you see it as one continuum, actually? Yeah, no, I mean, it was, um, it was interesting, because that, of course, came up very early on, right? Like, how much, you know, do we want to push fabrication, right? You know, but it turned out, working with Cora out of Madison, you know, you know, they were incredible, they were curious, and they were responsive, and they really wanted to figure out, well, how can we make this work? Um, Mijin and Eric had worked with them on their um, memorial at MIT previously, right? So they had a working relationship and that really pushed Cora to invest in technology. So they were like, game, let's see, you know, and then when Eto came on board, it was like, all right, let's, you know, let's see what this produces. And there's a really great photograph. I wasn't there, but with Eto and Eric actually in the stone yard hammering, trying to create bush hammering, to really understand physically what that meant. Right. And so much of, you know, as you know, in you, you just do mock-ups. I mean, there are just mock-ups of all this stuff, like, you know, to kind of see like what the impact is. And it very, I mean, and what's great is that even though it's incredibly precise, it's, it's so depends on like what time of day, what clouds, sometimes you see Isabel, sometimes you don't. She's very ephemeral, ephemeral, ephemeral. We didn't plan for the memory marks to, it just happened. Mijin was on really? site. Really? Yeah. And she That's sent amazing. back this photograph. It's like, look. Wow. Um, you know, I mean, we had all these conversations about how deep should they go, the length, you know, that had to be calibrated with the type. We had type wars. I mean, you know, like everything <laughs> was, you know, was, was negotiation. So, you know, it was interesting. And we had an amazing contractor, a black owned firm, um, Team Henry out of Richmond, who did the construction, and they were really exceptional. They, they did an amazing job. It's because it's a complicated project. You know, here you have all of these pieces arriving, and, you know, there was extensive site work that had to be done. And yeah, so that's what I mean. It like literally took a village um, to do the project. So, and we had amazing, I didn't say this, amazing uh, collaborators in the Office of the University Architects of UVA. So they were our sort of internal counterparts, Alice Rauscher and um, uh, Mary Hughes and Sarita Herman, who is the kind of project manager, and, and they were just phenomenal. We have uh, one more question in the chat that I think might be a really nice one uh, to wrap up on because it, it pulls the conversation back to pedagogy, which has uh, been a, a, an ongoing discussion we've been having within the school all year. Uh, so Diego says, many thanks for your awesome presentation. Following the suggestions of collective as a response to liberal individualism, how can architectural education change to support more collective teams and projects, or even a collective mindset rather than featuring the individual star architect? Yeah. <laughs> Diego, great question. I mean, I have noticed recently, certainly at, at GSEP, like there are so many now co collectives, right? 
there's QCEP, there, you know, like students are organizing groups to kind of engage in pressing issues. They work, you know, not as individuals, but collaboratively, more so than the sense of the individual architect going out to establish, which was typically his practice. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there is something interesting about that. And I don't know, is it because kind of technologies allow us to be more connected and to work more collaborative that might have something to do with it? Um, but I, but I think it's an interesting, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting um, phenomenon. I mean, I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do you think, Mokena, Zach, Maria? Well, I've I've got a question for 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 Mario. So I'll, maybe he'll take that one. Then I can follow up because I have a question for him. But yeah. Um, well, I I appreciate um, Diego's question because. Um, as Zach mentioned at the uh, beginning during the, during the introduction, um, I co-taught a professional practice course at Alton uh, last semester, and this is one of this is one of the topics of the course, um, which had to do with thinking about how do we form practices, how do we form collaboratives, how do we form collectives as a uh, as a model for professional practice. Um, and I agree with Mabel in terms of seeing. Uh, our students at Columbia you know, form uh, student organizations, um, but also I think engaging uh, and being more willing to engage in uh, in teamwork, you know, even in studio projects, um, and wanting to engage in teamwork for for studio projects. Um, and as we know that um, you know a number of the let's say partnerships, and I mean more than two people. You know, that we know of, you know, practicing in New York now, or or groups that formed when they were students, some of my colleagues even you know, at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Zach. I know you wanted to close out. Can I just make one more question? Is that all right? Absolutely. Yes, please. Cool. You're just, cool. You've got so much energy. I'm in awe. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, I, I decided. And it's I'm just going to wait for the sun to come up. <laughs> It's 325. It is. Trust me. I'm like, how is going to work? Got to be up by six. Um, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, Mary and Mabel, your, your work has, you know, intersected um, and has a number of adjacencies and it's been beautiful to watch it, watch them um, both evolve both together and separately. I, I'd like, Mary, maybe if you could just give us uh, some insight into the protest machine. I was really intrigued by the images that, that Mabel shared. Um, and, and I'd love to know, you know, what were the conversations around that, if there were, or, um, what were your thoughts and, and yeah, what, what is the protest machine? Uh, well, you know, I'll try to be as brief as possible, um, uh, given the time. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I can certainly, you know, you know, as you said, you know, our Mabel and my sort of work. I would say not only intersects, I mean, it just kind of aligns. I mean, there are conversations that we've been having, work that we've been doing. Um, and certainly the African Mobilities project, I think was influential upon this, for me, this project with, with MoMA in terms of thinking about the spatial choreography, if you will, of protest of, 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 you know, of of the occupation of public space in the city. And so the, the protest machine for, for Nashville um, looks at sort of the, the history in terms of the civil rights history, but also the most more recent history included in terms of Black Lives Matter and tries to, tr to understand that as a, as a spatial condition and what that might mean for architecture. Um, so the protest machine um, enacts, if you will, th those movements, those uh, uh, those engagements of the body in, in public space. I guess that's a real kind of short and maybe even a little bit flat um, answer to your question. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great answer. It's a, it's a great answer. And I think it's um, uh, a beautiful th synthesis of what you described. It looks very compelling. And I, I wish I was in New York to go <laughs> see all of the work of the whole collective and so on. Um, uh, I just wanted to make one other closing comment or rather an observation. Um, when I was doing um, research of my own on memorials in South Africa, um, I was struck when you described how 
uh, black bodies were were you know buried outside of the proverbial wall, you know, unmarked, and in quite a deliberate fashion. Um, that happened quite a bit in Cape Town also. So both at Robben Island and in various parts of the old map of Cape Town where the old city walls were found, um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of unnamed bodies who do not deserve the dignity of, of being given a, a, a tombstone. And I think there's something to be said about the sort of global phenomena of this, of this discourse, right? That on the one hand, there are very specific you know, interventions to a city, to a place that are very particular. But I think in many ways, um, many parts of the world are grappling with the legacy that, you know, this, this was, this was a, uh, maybe, maybe genocide is a harsh term, but let's just say that this was a, a, a global practice and a, and a, and a global, um, I don't know what the word is, um, I, I just saw the presentation and I was really struck by the parallels in terms of the Southern African landscape. Um, different micro realities, but very similar macro realities, you know, and, and I just wanted to put that onto the table that, um, that perhaps there's also something there. And that's why the Global Africa Lab, I think, also begins to draw these nets and networks across the world. But I think we can never forget about the commonality of the strife and suffering that was played out, you know. Uh, we have our own wine farms in the Western Cape, which uh, very much uh, uh, mimic or parallel uh, plantations. Uh, just as a different commodity, in a, but the, the principle of labor and extraction and false opulence is exactly the same. Anyway, just an observation. Yeah, no, I mean, I think your point around um, the legacy of dehumanization of not you know, you know, somebody like Sylvia Winter would just argue, yeah, I mean, that dehumanization is exactly what produces the category of the modern human, right? Or man one and man two in the West. Um, and so, um, you know, that's part and parcel so that you can make someone's life disposable. You know, Foucault would say it's what, you know, modern government tell you either make live and all the resources go to make life splendid and thrive or let die. So you don't get any resources. So we extract your labor and then you get, you know, crappy housing, bad air, poison water, whatever, and you're just let die. And so that's somehow, I think, baked into these kinds of systems, right, of inequality. And again, like rationalize the irrational, right, um, of, of, of that, of death, the horizon of death, as some people would, would call it. So, and, and yeah, and you're right. I mean, a lot of these, the work kind of comes out of conversations with you and within Poe, particularly these conversations around mobility, right? Because we worked on a project with the University of Western Cape, looking at the impact of mobility around getting to school and the legacy of the apartheid landscape. And it's a whole other body of work and conversation we could talk about. So, but thank you both um, for joining this evening. Yes. And uh, our apologies to the audience members whose questions and comments we didn't get to. I'll point out uh, just one from Professor Christina Sharp, who was in the audience this Christina! evening. Who says just thanks and more thanks to Mabel <laughs> for that beautiful lecture and to Mario and Mokena for the discussion. And as this marks our final forum lecture of the 2020-2021 academic year, I'd like to once again thank our forum sponsors for their generosity and support and extend huge thank yous to director Jill Stoner, John Cook, Gabrielle Argent, Ellen Parasud, and Mike Getz for their support of this year's forum lecture series. And especially thank you to Mario and Mokena, and thank you to Mabel for your lecture, your scholarship, and for generously sharing your time with us tonight. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night and good morning. Yes.